Recording started. Okay, today we're going to be talking about nuclear energy. So, now, first of all, what we want to understand about nuclear energy is that we're talking about the nucleus uh, in particular. And the way that we're going to sort of designate, um, you know, what nucleus we're dealing with and its characteristics is we use, you know, this type of format. X and then A is a superscript and Z is a subscript. Now the X would be some type of chemical symbol or element um, or of the element. So for hydrogen it would be H, right? Uh, for helium be HE. So each element has a, a symbol from periodic table. Now the top number is the mass number. So if you take the number of protons and you add to it the number of neutrons you will get the atomic mass number. And the Z is always the atomic number, okay, so which is the number of protons. So here we have an example of carbon uh, 12 and carbon 14. So here we can see the element symbol is carbon in both cases. And in both cases, in order to be the element carbon, it has to have six protons. But what we will notice is that we have a different mass number for 12 and for 14. Now, elements that have a different mass, but the same number of protons, which they have to, to be an element, um, we call those isotopes. <clears throat> now, stable nuclei are not radioactive. Now, radioactive basically means that they're, the nucleus is emitting some type of radiation. Now, the stable nucleus has balanced forces in the nucleus. So the forces of repulsion between the protons is uh, balanced by the strong nuclear force, which is an attractive force. Okay, so you have uh, electrostatic force, which has been linked with, um, you know, the weak nuclear force. Basically, the weak nuclear force and the electro uh, or electrodynamic forces have been suggested that they're basically the same thing, but your strong nuclear force uh, keeps the protons together. Now you should note that the protons have uh, you know all the same charge. They're being packed together so the closer you pack them or the more you pack uh, together the stronger this repulsive force is going to be. So as nuclei become larger they tend to become less stable. Alright let's just define a few terms here. Strong nuclear force is the attractive force between nuclear particles that acts over short distances. Radioactive decay is the spontaneous change in which an unstable nucleus emits radiation. An alpha particle is a positively charged particle consisting of two neutrons and two protons which is a helium nucleus. An alpha radiation is a stream of alpha particles being emitted from uh, an unstable nuclei. And it is one of the three principal types of nuclear radiation. And the other two are beta radiation and gamma radiation. Okay, now an unstable nucleus emits particles and energy. And the three types, as we've mentioned, are alpha radiation, beta, and gamma radiation. And here you see <coughs> um, a nucleus where it has unbalanced forces and it's emitting, in this case, uh, alpha particles. Okay, which are helium nuclei. And this would therefore be alpha radiation or alpha decay. Now, some isotopes are unstable. So we talked about carbon 12. Carbon 12 is stable. It does not emit radioactive uh, particles. Or it doesn't emit particles, period, from the nucleus. Uh, carbon 14, different story, it does. Okay, so some isotopes are going to be unstable and therefore radioactive. So if they have one less particle, um, like a neutron, it can weaken the nuclear force. And this causes some isotopes to break apart into alpha particles or helium nucleus. So here's a balanced, well, here's a decay equation we want to write for um, a mercurium 241. So since we're told this is an alpha decay, okay, we know that we're emitting an alpha particle. 
which is the helium nucleus. Okay, now one thing about writing these equations is the mass number and the um, charge basically, or the atomic number, has to add up to be the same. <clears throat> so here we had 241, and here we have 4. So in order to balance this out, we're going to take 241 and subtract 4. Okay, so what's that going to be? That's going to be 237. So 237 has to be the mass number for this other particle. Now, to really determine what particle it is, we have to take the 95 and minus the 2, which will give us a 93 for the, the atomic number. And the atomic number de really defines the um, element. So we look in periodic table under 93, and we have neptunium. And so we can write that down. So really how we would write this down is uh, NP, and it was 93, and would be to, let's see, 37. I'm going to move that NP. There you go. Something like that. <clears throat> okay, so here's a basic alpha emission from uh, uranium. And notice we have an alpha particle being emitted, which means that the other particle has to be, um, you know, four atomic mass units smaller and two protons uh, less. And that's thorium. A beta radiation. Uh, can come about from um, a beta particle being emitted. A beta particle is basically an electron. So an electron is, is said to have zero mass and a negative one charge. So here's the tritium beta decay process. So tritium is an isotope of hydrogen, has three uh, atomic mass units, or atomic mass of three, and it's going to decay into. Um, helium and a beta particle and an antineutrino. So beta decay is a little bit more complicated because you can have the transmutation of elements, which means the changing of one element to another. So in this case, as soon as you gain a proton, all right, um, you are changing the atomic number and therefore the element. So how do we gain this proton? I thought we were losing an electron. Well a neutron is basically a electron or proton together. It has a neutral charge because the proton has a positive charge and the electron has a negative charge. So if it loses the electron it's left with, or if it loses the electron, it's left with the positive charge and becomes a proton. Okay, and that's how we get the change here. But notice the numbers will still add up. I have 1 on this side, and if I take 2 minus 1, I'll end up with a positive 1 as a net charge on that side. So it does balance out. Also, the masses, 3 on this side, 3 and 0 on this side, so 3 also balances out. Now, the antineutrino is in there, and it conserves basically momentum, all right, in this exchange. And the antineutrino is always present in a, a negative um, <clears throat> beta decay. So here's another representation of a beta emission. In this case, we have a iodine-131, um, which is undergoing a beta decay. And a transmutation occurs. So one of the uh, neutrons turns into a proton, and you now have an atomic number of 54, which is xenon and the mass remains the same. Now, gamma radiation is the most energetic form of radiation, uh, which is a form of EMR, or electromagnetic resonance. And the gamma photon, um, you know, has all the characteristics of, of EMR, uh, but it has very, very high energy. So here's an, uh, an example of a gamma emission where you may have, um, you know, previously had 
say a beta emission, and then you leave this this nucleus in an excited energy state, and this excited energy uh, state will, you know, be unstable, and so the nucleus emits this energy in the form of a gamma photon and then becomes uh, more stable. So there, there is no change in mass number, there is no change in atomic number when you're dealing with gamma emission or gamma radiation. You just have going from an excited to uh, a non-excited state and the emission of a, a gamma photon. So here's the general nuclear equations for alpha, beta, and positron emission. Now positron emission is basically um, beta emission, except instead of there being, uh, you know, an electron emitted, you emit a positron. And a positron is like a positive electron. So now that goes a little bit beyond the scope of, of the Science 30 course, but uh, just to sort of let you know that it exists. And in a positron emission, you also would have the emission of a neutrino to balance the momentums, um, as opposed to an anti-neutrino in, in beta emission. And electron capture is just basically the opposite of, of a beta emission, where an electron is um, absorbed by a nucleus, and it changes the element to, uh, to a different element. Measuring radiation. Now, radiation, we've talked about the different types, but now we're going to talk a little bit about measuring it. Now, a Geiger counter is a device that detects and measures the intensity of ionizing radiation. And ionizing radiation is basically radiation that has enough energy to cause uh, the electrons to be stripped off of, of the nucleus. Nuclear fission. Uh, now, we're talking about nuclear reactions, nuclear power, and so we're going to talk about nuclear fission. And nuclear fission is the splitting of a large nucleus into smaller nuclei. That's very important. Um, now, the particle, you know, when you split the nucleus, there's going to be energy released, and it's actually a large amount of energy being released. It can, you know, be used to power atomic power plants uh, and has was used in the first atomic bombs. So the energy released is, is a lot more than the chemical energy released in a chemical reaction. And when we say a lot more, we, we're talking about several orders of magnitude greater. A lot, lot more. And here's kind of a, a representation. And to initiate a fission reaction, you usually have a slow-moving neutron. And it's interesting that a fast-moving neutron will not do it uh, because you need the neutron to kind of stick in the nucleus and then cause it to, to be unstable and then it spontaneously splits. Okay, if you're shooting it at a, like a large um, nucleus like an uranium-235 nucleus. Okay, and then you have your fission, fission products. Uh, here you have barium-141 and crypto-92. Okay, and this is the interesting part, is that, one of the interesting parts, the neutron, once it hits the nucleus and causes it to split, uh, there's a release of three subsequent neutrons. So you can see how a cascade effect or a chain reaction can occur because one neutron can cause one fission, but the release of three catalysts of subsequent fission events. Okay, so it goes one to three, to 9, to 27, and so on and so forth. So in a very short period of time, you have this geometric progression of fission. And, and it's this chain reaction that can cause a nuclear explosion. Okay, and here's a, a representation of a nuclear reaction that perpetuates itself is a chain reaction. And it's caused by this release of neutrons that we're talking about during nuclear fission. So one neutron comes in, and you've got three neutrons going out, and they're going to split the next three. And then those three are going to split uh, and release nine neutrons in total, which can cause nine subsequent uh, fission events. Okay, and then from nine to 27, and then 
27 times 3. Uh, what's that? Uh, 27 times 3. Like 81. So, in a very short amount of time, you have a huge amount of, of fission occurring. Now, <clears throat> when that type of, of cascading effect or chain reaction gets out of control, you can have things like a nuclear meltdown. And that's the, the result of improper control of a nuclear reaction within a reactor, which causes the increase of the temperature of the core in the nuclear reactor beyond its ability to, to cope with it. Now, the core is always going to get hot because it needs to be you know, hot in order to turn the water to steam, which runs a steam turbine, which produces the power. Okay, but if it's too hot, then everything just starts to melt, basically. And the resulting damage can, you know, be a real environmental hazard because you have the release of these nuclear active materials into the environment. Now, the energy in a nuclear reaction, fission or fusion, which we haven't talked about yet, is e equals mc squared where E equals a change in energy. M is the mass of products minus the mass of the reactant. So it's known as the mass defect, and C is the speed of light. So you can see, you know, speed of light squared, that's like 6 times 10 to the 16. Nine, or not 6, 9 times 10 to the 16. So 9 times 10 to the 16 multiplied by, you know, even a small mass gives you, uh, you know, a significant amount of energy. And the masses involved are small on the scale of one atom, but as you convert, you know, lots and lots of atom, um, from, well, of the mass from different atoms into energy, it is an enormous amount of energy that is released. Now, to find the change in mass, um, you need to take a look at the mass of the reactants and the mass of the products. So if we take a look above at our equation, we have uranium-235 reacting with the neutron, which is initiating the fission event, and is breaking down into krypton-92 and barium-141 and three neutrons. Okay, and it says there's a, a total energy release of 230 times 10 to the 6 electron volts. Now, electron volt is actually a measure of energy, so you'd multiply electron volts times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules in order to get, uh, you know, the, the number of joules that this many electron volts represents. Okay. But just for one atom to release that much energy due to its fission is amazing. Okay. So if we take the, the molar mass, and here it is being um, expressed in kilograms per mole. So you can take the grams per mole um, value for the molar mass of those isotopes and, you know, basically turn it to kilograms per mole by dividing by 1,000 then multiplied by number of moles as is indicated in the, the nuclear reaction. And you'll see that the mass of the reactants is 236.052 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms. Then do the same thing with the products and you'll find out that uh, you have 235.8665 times 10 to the negative 3 kilograms. So there's a mass difference, and that difference you will, you know, find by subtracting one from the other. Now to find out the amount of energy that represents, you could multiply by, because this is the m in equals mc squared equation, multiply by 9 times 10 to 16. So 1.86 to the exponent negative 4, multiplied by 9 exponent 16 and I get about 1.674 times 10 to the 13 um, joules. Hmm. 
So that's that's a bunch. <clears throat> that's a lot of energy. Wow. Okay. But that's for a mole. Okay, and a mole is, I guess, a significant amount of that substance. Okay, nuclear fusion. Now, fission is the splitting of a large nucleus to produce two small nuclei and a release of energy. Fusion is the opposite. You take two small nuclei and you cause them to uh, form together and release energy. This also releases vast amounts of energy. <clears throat> Now, if we're talking about renewable energy, fusion is considered to be a, a renewable resource for the future. Fission and combustion of fossil fuels are considered to be non-renewable. That's because fission uh, relies on the use of uh, uranium, okay, or isotopes that are derived from uranium. So there's only a set amount of uranium that is available on the Earth. So therefore, it's non-renewable. Okay, once it's used up, it's used up. Same thing with fossil fuels. Fusion, on the other hand, uh, is happening from deuterium. Uh, you know, is is what is happening mostly in the sun anyway. Okay, because fusion reactions occur in the sun to give the sun its power. Now, to have those fusion events happening on Earth, that has not been perfected by any extent or any means yet. Okay, it's, it's still um, being researched quite a bit. Okay, but if they could do it, you basically, you know, the most abundant element in the universe is hydrogen. And, you know, so uh, the hydrogen isotopes that would be used for um, fusion are almost limitless. Okay, so geothermal energy, tidal and solar, as well as hydroelectric, are also considered to be renewable forms of energy. Uh, you know, a term that's also used instead of renewable these days is uh, alternative energies. So, that's the discussion of that topic. Once you've listened to the tutorial, make sure you submit a tutorial somewhere. Have a good day.